Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast. I'm Katie Brand and today I'll be selecting some very special moments from previous Penguin Podcasts. As you may or may not know, on this podcast we ask authors to bring in a handful of objects that have inspired their writing and creativity. And so we'll be hearing why Johnny Marr always has a £20 note in his pocket, how a framed letter written by William Wordsworth is hanging in Sebastian Falk's living room, and why one of our guests brought in a favourite prop used by Charles Dickens. But more than that, we'll discover how our guests have learned to tame their monsters. Ramesh Ranganathan and Ruby Wax harness the nebulous craft of comedy. Zadie Smith and William Boyd discuss the notion of fame. And Pat Barker and Jeff Kinney talk about how to put off putting off. The writer's nemesis, procrastination. But first, what if your day-to-day job involves danger? I asked astronaut Tim Peake how vulnerable he felt going on a spacewalk with only a cord between him, the space station and the rest of the universe. And this is what he said. You know, you do actually feel fairly safe and secure when you're next to structure, you know, large parts of the space station. But then there are parts of the spacewalk where you have to go. I mean, we were working right at the very furthest edge of the space station, repairing one of the solar panels. And to my right hand side, there was nothing. I was literally hanging on with one handrail and over my right shoulder was just the rest of the universe. And it's very, very black, very intimidating. But at the same time, once you embrace it and get used to it, it's actually really incredible. I just hooked myself on with a small tether, let go with both hands and just enjoyed floating there, watching Earth in one direction and the universe in the other direction. And I have to say, during the interview, when he said that, my stomach just turned over and all my arms were covered in goosebumps just at the incredible image he evoked with those words. Just extraordinary. And here's another explorer, Michael Palin, being asked by David Baddiel during a special live Penguin podcast about the risks he encountered during filming. Is there any times that you felt, oh, I know this is getting really dodgy when you've been in the Antarctic or...? Well, I I remember when we filmed at the North Pole. As you know, the North Pole is just on open sea and we filmed in May and it was ice was supposed to be covered over the whole area and so that we could land a plane at exactly where 90 degrees was and I could do my piece to camera and all that. I couldn't see a float that was big enough to take a plane. And these guys were circling around and circling around. They said, oh, yeah, yeah, we found one, one down there. So we go down, and they suddenly abort it. I said, oh, thank God, I don't want to do this. This is mm. ridiculous. And uh, I said, yeah, is it too small? They said, we need sunshine before right. we can land. And I said, surely, come on. It doesn't have to be look good. Let's just do it and go. Yeah. And just wait for the sunshine. You know, the sunshine is important because in that way, you can see the shadows, which will show you the ridges on the ice. So I said, all right, let's wait for the sunshine. So yeah. we circle around where the North Pole is. I'm waiting to land on a moving ice flow yeah. um, when the sun comes out. And we did eventually. And right. God, I mean, if that you actually terrifying. look at the footage... If, presumably the ice could have cracked. The ice could have cracked, yeah. Uh, The wonderful Michael Palin there. And another TV presenter who has been in some very tight spots when making documentaries is Reggie Yates. And here he is talking to David. What about fear? What about when you felt frightened in these situations? You say they're scared the crap out of me. You know, you are putting yourself into perilous situations. How do you contain the fear? You know this. There's that weird thing of being on camera in any situation Mm. where you kind of plug into this strange for want of a better word, arrogance. And that is that nothing can happen to me because I'm on camera. Mm. And you sort of have to believe that. Mm. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do what it is you need to do. That really is a serious point, actually. When you put yourself in these situations, whether it be Africa or Russia or whatever, whatever pre-scripted idea of what's going to happen is going to happen, it has to go out the window because all sorts of stuff will go on. Yeah. Where you think, okay, this situation's not been pre-prepared. Yeah, and you can't predict everyone's behaviour. Yeah. So the best thing you can do, I find, is treat people with respect. You know, I was raised in an environment where, at times, it got a bit hairy. Yeah. And I was raised to believe, you know, if you shake a man's hand firmly and you look him in the eye, you will be treated with the respect that you're giving. And that has served me really well. It served me, I, mean, I was an inmate in a Texas jail for one of my documentaries for a week. And... I didn't feel threatened. I walked in and was a little bit worried Mm. and then quite quickly after meeting people and I literally went around everybody in the pod which was made up of 60 men and I shook everybody's hand. And after that, I was just another guy in an orange jumpsuit. 
Reggie Yates on overcoming fear there. And another of my guests, Oscar-nominated actress Gabourey Sidibe, star of the film Precious, had concerns of a more unusual nature. You know, I had like a chapter list and I was like, oh, I'll write about, you know, hair and fashion and why I hate dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. To be fair, <laughs> let me just clarify. Sorry, can I, can I just clarify? You hate dinosaurs. It's not a hate of dinosaurs. Okay. <laughs> it's, I miss Because I don't find dinosaurs impact my life that much day to day. Right, but maybe right. It's different. You don't think it does. Okay. <laughs> you don't know. You have no idea. Okay, no, please explain. Because help they're me, the help me. silent killer. Maybe, maybe this has been my problem all along. <laughs> I guess it's a fear mm -hmm. and I process it through hate. Do you know the dinosaurs? That's gasoline. They're yes. everywhere. Fossil they do, fuels. Yes, it's yes. fossil fuels. They and do diamonds. In fact, and like, diamonds. And diamonds. <laughs> and like, look, if, they're, if they lived millions of years ago and they're powerful enough to make our cars go vroom, mm -hmm. nope, I don't trust it. I just yeah. don't trust it. They can come back. Their DNA is everywhere. They can come back at any moment. And mm -hmm. I'm not having it. Okay. I'm not having it. Gabare Sidibe there educating me on the constant threat posed by dinosaurs. And as we heard there, the line between fear and comedy is often a fragile one, especially when it comes to stand-up. And here's Ramesh Ranganathan talking to Nihal Athanayaka about the casual and to some terrifying way he prepares for his stand-up shows. So are the words that you write down, is it like being on a plane, mm. you know, kind of parachute regiment, each word is like the parachute you'd throw out the plane and then you jump out to try and catch it. So the word is a test to yourself to go, can I catch that word, control that word and take that word into other places? Or is it much more controlled than that? I know exactly what I'm doing. I've no, got I, don't, I don't know what I'm doing. So, so like it will be something I want to talk around and then it might be like a couple of things that I think are interesting about that topic, but it won't be jokes. I don't write jokes now. I just write what I find interesting about that. And then I will just talk until I find the funny. So like I'd go to a gig and I won't know where the jokes are. I've, j I've got, like, the topics, and so I think I'm going to talk about this tonight. That's how I tend That's to write. That's such a high-risk strategy, isn't it? Yes, and it is extremely punishing on people that see my material for the first time because <laughs> sometimes you just don't find it. Comedian Ramesh Ranganathan there. And here's an author who has had the opposite approach to comedy. He plots and plans every single joke. Jeff Kinney, author of the Diary of a Wimpy Kid series, is part of an elite group of authors who have sold more than 100 million copies of their books. To date, Jeff has sold 200 million plus. Here he is talking to Connie Huck about his method. He's clearly doing something right. It's a lot of the experiences you write about, are they sort of real happenings that have occurred? Yeah, and these days I'm spending a lot of time on planes and in airports. And, and of course, comedy really is just tragedy plus time. When I read the first third of this book, it actually kind of stresses me out. I'm like, <laughs> are there any jokes in here? I can't even tell. You know, is this funny? I can't tell if it would be funny to a kid. Because it's hits per minute in that book. It's like gag, gag, gag. There's a lot packed in there. Yeah, I usually have about 350 jokes per book. That's what I draw from. And that's how I write, actually. I yep. write my gags first, and then once I get to the 350 mark, then I can start writing the manuscript. Oh, so you sort of string them together, yeah. and the story forms around them. Yeah, and it's one of the reasons that my narratives in the first several books aren't especially strong, because the priority of the books, in my mind, is humor, is that if they're not funny, then they don't have a reason to be. In researching and writing books about mental health, actress Ruby Wax changed the way she performed comedy. Here, David Baddiel challenges her on stand-up, especially when she uses herself as the material. As you say in the book, mindfulness is about being compassionate to yourself. And you were always and still are, like the most unbelievably kind of self-deprecating, like having a go at yourself, finding every single bad thing you could possibly think of mm. for yourself and putting that out there. Well, as a comedian. So you're like really cruel to yourself as a well, comedian. Well, except now my comedy. I don't do that. Look how fat I am. I never liked that. But, you know, if you said, you know, I got an OB, he's my opener, my show's over. Right. Funny is going, you know what happened to me. But funny isn't what a lot of comedians do, especially women, saying nobody dates me, I'm a dog. Mm -hmm. That ain't happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You found a way of... Keeping that funny. Because I think funny needs to be hard a lot of the time. Yeah, it but needs it doesn't to, it doesn't have, want to be, you don't have to attack yourself. No, you don't have to attack yourself. And you can still have a proper 
muscular, you know, really hard edge type of comedy without losing compassion. And I think that's an amazing space to be in. Yeah. It's like with me now. If I was being passive aggressive, you'd sense it and the audience would sense it. I think if your heart is open and Mm. you're really pleased just to be alive Mm. or whatever, and then you know you've got good lines, so you're a conductor in front of an orchestra rather than spewing your rage, pull the anger back, you know, then be funny. Some fascinating observations about comedy from the multifaceted Ruby Wax there. You're listening to a special edition of the Penguin Podcast. If you've missed any editions so far, you can download them for free on iTunes, SoundCloud, Acast and any number of podcast players such as Spotify, Overcast and Stitcher. Now, authors, especially best-selling ones, can hold a curious position of seeing fame from both sides. They move in circles with famous people but may write about celebrity from the point of view of an outsider. Catelyn Moran wrote a book, How to Be Famous, with that concept at its heart. Here she is talking to David Baddiel about why she'd rather walk in Lady Gaga's shadow than in her own spotlight. In a sense, you're a reporter, you're still a journalist, yes. or a writer, so you're sort of writing missives back from the world of fame. You're not writing so much from the position of being famous in this book, well, even was, though you are famous. Well, well, I have done everything I can to be as unfamous as possible. You know, I've been you know, asked to do, like, Celebrity Big Brother or, like, kind of, like, go to Naomi Campbell's dinner parties and, and you know, all these things, you know, the Time 100 People of the Year things, all this stuff. I just say no to all of it. I think if you're a writer, you need to not change the climate of the room when you walk in it. You don't mm. want to be the focus of attention. You mm. want to be watching other people. I just like describing things. That's mm. my biggest joy. If I get to follow Lady Gaga around for a day, I don't actually want to ask her a single question. I just want to describe what she does in that day. I like to watch. I mean, that's basically, I mean, 90% of fame is the entrance that you make. Yes. Like, kind of, it's the moment, it's the moment where you, and that tells you a lot about the psychology of fame. It's the moment where you impact. Yes. Like, what was the moment where. Because people, like, but also, why should people? track you and all your oh, complexity God, yeah, no, and all because yeah. you know they can do that with their nearest and dearest yes. why should they do it with someone they don't even actually know, oh, God, you no, know we're not designed to know 7,000 people that we are presented with all the time and, and the people who would track you all the way through that generally would be quite scary yes like, that, that's like... absolutely true <laughs> Here's Zadie Smith, no stranger to stardom herself, on creating a character in her book Swing Time who is a celebrity here she tells David what that revealed what I thought about that kind of fame, which, which I think is quite amusing about it, is that I hope that Amy wouldn't really be a character. She'd almost be an absence because mm. what forms around those people is almost more interesting, right? Like mm. they think they're the centre of everything, obviously because that's how it seems. They're paying everybody. But the community around them, all the people who work for them, are their own ecosystem. Mm. And they've got loads of their own stuff going on, which after a while stops even really referring to the centre of this system. But in terms of what, uh, of what I was saying earlier about authenticity, I think that for those people, yeah. having met some of them myself, is that they lose who they are in the machine, in yes. the ecosystem. I think, I mean, nobody um, wants to feel sorry for a superstar. I don't blame them. But I suppose I feel that anything that stops you having a real relation to the world... Is, is sad. Mm. It's kind of pitiful. I mean, that's your one life, you know, that's it. And to spend it in entirely false relations with people all the time, it, I imagine is a very melancholy thing. Johnny Marr of The Smiths, and arguably one of the most influential guitarists in recent memory, came on the Penguin podcast to chat about his memoir, Set the Boy Free. He spoke to David about the moment when he realised he had hit the big time. To get national fame of that sort at 19 is very very young but if ever there was a 19 year old and a what 24 year old who were ready for it it was me and Morrissey mm. because we'd been in sort of so obsessive about it before and so it absolutely felt amazing we played top of the pops we bolted it up there's two things that and they're in the book that um sum that moment up one is the delight and glee of everybody's families who were in the dressing room and the total bemusement. They came, we'd been on top of the pops and it was like everybody had won the pools. Mm. Then I'd go out and we'd play the show and bodies on, all over the stage and all, you know, it really did feel like homecoming heroes. They, we were made to feel that way. But it was that thing where I was playing and about five feet away from me or five people away or whatever for pretty much the whole gig was this delirious guy on his mate's shoulders with his shirt off absolutely hysterical and I worked out after a few songs because he was trying to get to me it was someone who'd been one of my mates I remember that bit in the book yeah that must be amazing and 
that was really so weird. Yeah. It sort of says, I've, I'm on a different planet now, yeah. isn't it? In a very real way. And what if you're a writer and one of the world's most famous rock stars asks you to write a book with him? Here's William Boy telling Nihal Athanayaka all about it. You've had time to write a James Bond novel and also a fictional biography of David Bowie. I had a curious relationship with David Bowie in the late 90s and the early 2000s. We were both on the editorial board of this art magazine, so it had nothing to do with David Bowie rock icon. We had this strange relationship around a book. He was the publisher of this little book, Nat Tate, an American artist, and he actually wrote the blurb for it. I mean, how cool is that? How did you find him? He was delightful, but kind of intense, I would say. He was always wanted to talk quite seriously about art, and you might have a hangover, and the last thing you wanted to do was start talking about, you know, is, is Rembrandt better than Tintoretto? Kind of it had a hunger for knowledge, and I think because he was a, an autodidact, you know, because he was learning himself and teaching himself, he used these opportunities to kind of have a Q&A session almost. So, but, you know, I saw him in New York, and he was uh, great to hang out with as well. William Boyd talking there. Michael Palin has written diaries since the beginning of his fame, the start of the seminal Monty Python. Little did he know that critics would chastise him for writing about his celebrity encounters. Here's Michael speaking to David Baddiel on that special live podcast. Right. So the first year of the diary is, is written when I'm filming Monty Python most of the time and doing the shows. And it's really interesting because they're very short entries most of the time and very little is about Python. It's mainly about my son, Tom. He's like, I need to walk. Oh, yes, how wonderful. He just said his first word. Yeah. And all these classic sketches. People say, why didn't you write down what was it like when you yeah. first did Dead Parrot? Nothing yeah. there at all. It's all about Tom, you know, having yeah, but that's fair thrown enough. up the night before. Is there a self-consciousness that eventually sets in? I mean, how do you stop that setting in when you start thinking, oh, you know, originally when you're writing, you're just writing your diary. Yeah. Then there's a point later on there must be where you think, oh, hold on a minute, these have become like historical documents because yeah. I'm a member of Monty Python. and I, Do you know what I mean? You must yes. think, like, these are going to be published. One yeah, I mean, Does that, that change the way you write them? I, I hope not. I mean, there was, was there a review of the third lot of diaries which said, uh, Michael, he's just keen on saying all the famous people he met. But, I mean, I quite like meeting famous people. I was quite rather interested in them yeah. and all that. So when I write my diary now, I govern the number of famous people I write about. Right. <laughs> so I'm afraid right. you won't get in it, no, David. Shit. Not I was today say, at all. <laughs> make an exception. I want to see when I buy your volume No, you're the four. only famous yeah, yeah. person I've well, met today. Yeah. So that's, you'll, be, you'll be in there, In Dulwich definitely. with... I'm not going to mention yeah. who it was. <laughs> Michael Palin there, talking about a diary, one of a handful of brilliant objects he brought along to the recording. In fact... All of our guests specially select items that have helped them unlock their creativity. So let's listen to a few of those gems now. In a special podcast mashup, we have the No Such Thing as a Fish team, who have their own brilliant podcast. Dan, James, Anna and Andy, the brains behind the facts-based TV show QI, tell presenter Paul Smith about their very unique chosen object. <laughs> what we have here, listeners... There's a, a bottle of a certain liquid that people enjoy on a semi-regular basis, depending on how affluent you are. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, you will find out from the noise exactly what we have as our final object here on the yeah. Penguin podcast. Anna is opening the bottle. I'm really sorry if this takes anyone's eye out. Yeah, watch out. It's not just a bottle of champagne, it's a bottle of champagne and a pint glass, so we now have a pint of champagne. Mm -hmm. Why have you chosen a pint of champagne? Yeah, Anna, it's her rider. I just... <laughs> it was what I require. It is a rider of someone, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It was a rider of Charles Dickens, in fact, wasn't it? So in the 19th century, Charles Dickens used to go around doing shows. Um, he did a lot of performances. He used to, to do readings of his books. Yeah. And he was also a mesmerist. And so he used to hypnotise his wife on stage and stuff as his party trick. And he always had a pint of champagne before going on stage because it inspired him. The reason we've chosen this for us specifically is that we did try to do this once on one of our first yeah. live shows so we Dan and I drank a pint of champagne each before going on stage and I think it was a roaring success. A favourite prop there of Charles Dickens. And now to another Victorian writer, William Wordsworth. 
Here, birdsong author Sebastian Falk tells Nihal Athanayaka how he came to own one of his hero's letters and what it means to him. We have a handwritten letter next up by uh, William Wordsworth. This is your second object for us. Why this, Sebastian? This letter, which is in pen on a rather... Uh, it's making a bit of a noise because it's, it's in a frame, a metal-rimmed glass it would frame. Be, yeah. uh, <laughs> this, my wife found this in a sale catalogue uh, and bought it for me and gave it to me as a present. It's an inconsequential letter, but it is by William Wordsworth, who is a great hero of mine and one of the great poets in English. And actually to have in your hand something that he wrote is just incredibly thrilling. I don't know if you'd like me to read out to you what it says. It's not, yes. It's not, I wish it was, Dear Coleridge, tomorrow we, we shall publish the lyrical ballads and change the course of English poetry. But actually, it's a note written from a, an inn. It's headed, Lion Inn Crofts, Tuesday. My dear sir, I am here, and I should be happy to call and sit an hour with you this evening if I could be admitted in Traveller's Déshabille. I travel on horseback southwards. I mean to start before breakfast tomorrow. Ever faithfully yours, William Wordsworth. It's essentially a text message. Yes, it's a text <laughs> message you? of its day. <laughs> of its um, day, yeah. Here's the Smiths guitarist Johnny Marr describing to David Baddiel how he won't go on stage without this particular object. So where this £20 note comes in is because... Um, I just got this notion before we went on stage one night at Dingwalls that you're on the way up, you should be feeling lucky, but I was I had no money in my pocket. Yeah. So I thought, come on, you, you've got to feel a bit more regal. <laughs> that was I, that was my that was where it's coming from. But was it was it a tenner first of all? So yeah, I went to the manager, I went to Joe, and I said, Joe, have you got any money? I need to, what for? You know, he's the manager. I said, like, I need to feel lucky. <laughs> so he. He looked at me, you know, idiot. So anyway, he gave me a ten pound note and I put it in my back pocket. Yeah. And lo and behold, it was the first of our great ever gigs. When did it get upgraded to a twenty? It got upgraded to a twenty when um, I walked out on stage at the Oakland Coliseum with, <laughs> with the Pretenders, opening for you two to <laughs> ninety thousand people. As I walked out, it occurred to me that a tenor yeah won't, won't do the job. No, I need to. I need to upgrade. So I stuck twenty dollars in my pocket. Johnny Marr has played with many bands since and still carries on the twenty pound tradition. Objects have been a great source of inspiration to the authors we've chatted to, but what if you find it hard to put pen to paper in the first place? Here's Booker Prize winning Pat Barker, author of the Regeneration Trilogy, who tells me how she gets her work done. Uh, but, uh, one thing I do know, though, you know, it doesn't happen unless you actually sit there and make words appear on the screen. It doesn't matter if they're the wrong words. That's the essential precondition for any of the words being right. Because people are so curious about the the daily life or working life of writers. Everyone always wants to know. Well, I think there's almost a sense that somebody else has discovered how to make this an easy job and you want to find <laughs> out what they do. Yes. Yeah. You have to sit down, ideally at the same time, in the same place, and then if the muse is inclined to pay you a visit, at least she knows where to find you. <laughs> yes. Do you have any little tricks that you oh, use? I've, I've got a kitchen timer. It's in the shape of a tomato. So I will set it to sort of 25 minutes and I have to write for the 25 minutes. Sebastian Fox is a bit of an expert on how to avoid procrastination. Here he tells Nihal Athanayaka his secrets. We'll find out about Hector later on. But you didn't bring a catheter with you. I didn't bring a catheter, no. Was that a mistake? That was a mistake because I read a list of things that you used to put you off from writing. <laughs> oh, I thought it was because you were going to be taking the... Uh, uh, uh. I, I thought that was a really good list, the things that you do to, <laughs> to stop yourself from writing. It's quite an extensive mm -hmm. list. I get a lot of uh, magazine questions, people saying, tell us about your working day and so on and so forth. Of course, your working day is completely different uh, according to whether you're writing a book or thinking about a book. So um, I did 
recall how once, when I first started writing, I found it so difficult to concentrate that I would uh, draw the curtains, just focus a tight light on the on the desk, and it was a typewriter in those days, and I'd make a thermos of tea so that I didn't have the excuse to get up. And I'd almost manacle myself to the desk, and I did playfully say I did toy with the idea of inserting a catheter <laughs> to remove even that excuse for getting up from the desk. <laughs> Jeff Kinney's search for inspiration has involved some really extreme measures. Here he is talking to Connie Huck. I've tried everything. Every day, uh, let's say on the last book, mm. what I would do is I'd start my morning by taking a walk. And I'd walk away from my home and keep walking away uh, because I found that if I take a round trip, that once I get to the halfway point and turn around, my brain sort of, uh, sort of shuts off. So I have to walk in one direction. Sometimes I'll walk for as much as, uh, say, three or four hours. Uh-huh. I live in Massachusetts in the U.S., and sometimes I'll walk into a whole different state. Um, so then do you just Uber it back home? I, mean, <laughs> I have an assistant who is a, a very kind and patient with me, and I'll call her up and I'll say, Anna. I'm in a field right? miles away. I literally sometimes say, you know, there's a rock and there's a tree, you know, <laughs> come find me. But those methods don't really help that much. And didn't you also, you planned to fly to Florida because you thought that might give you some sort of inspiration and then you changed your mind on the way to the airport and then you ended up in Iceland That's without right. your clothes. I knew I had to go away to come up with jokes. Mm. I, I knew I had to leave my family for a time, but I hadn't planned it out. So I went to the airport, you know, thinking I'm going to go someplace warm and comfortable. And I was planning on going to Florida or Puerto Rico. And on the <laughs> way to the airport, I decided, you know what, I've never been to Iceland. And so I got the last ticket and then showed up with all of my... Speech. <laughs> with all my resort wear, had to buy a coat at the airport, had to buy, you know, other clothes. So, uh, Which is kind of in the book, isn't it? It is, yeah. So that came from that experience, Yes, right? it did, yeah. And finally, here's Catelyn Moran on how she finds her muse, talking to David Baddiel. You know, because writing is at some level, it's hard graft. Yes. It's, it is about sort of like sitting down and doing it. I don't know that it's about fetching something from the magical universe and bringing it back. Well, there's there's two things there. I mean, just just working hard and having some talent, like kind of, that's going to be 90% of your work. That's 90% of everybody's work. You're just grafting. Like, mm. bitch got to make rent. You know, mm. I love being called a hack. I will sit down and I will chop out those words as many as I need to every mm. day without cease. But there is a moment when the really good stuff happens. It does feel like it's from somewhere outside you or from a subconscious that's buried so deep that you've mm. had to get into another state to get it. Mm. There are there are times when I've written pages where I don't know where it came from. Mm. You're just kind of like, anyone else could have written that as well. There was some kind of massive server and I was the first, because I'd been sitting there for so long and working for so hard, I was the one that managed to get into that room and get right. that thing. And so many of the people that I've interviewed have said this when I was interviewing Keith Richards and I was saying, you know, do you regret the years that you were doing so many drugs and you were so out of it? And he was like, no, because the, the main thing that happened when I was on drugs is I would stay up later than everybody else. So I'd be sitting at a piano at five o'clock in the morning when everyone else had gone to bed and so I would get the songs that would come along at five o'clock in the morning mm. like they were they were there mm. and so so it, there's not an, a contradiction in, in my ethos that I do believe there's a kind of Jungian subcon- collective consciousness where these beautiful things are and I also believe in hard work because if you if you are the person that sits in that chair long enough writing long enough if you are a, you know a, a, a reliable vessel for things to come mm. through then you will win hopefully the inspiring moments some really interesting thoughts there on inspiration and hard work from the ever insightful Catelyn Moran. And that brings me to the end of this special edition. If you've missed any of the episodes featured, they are all waiting to be downloaded and you can do so on Acast, iTunes, SoundCloud and a whole host of podcast players. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Penguin UK Books. You can subscribe to ensure you receive all the latest episodes and feel free to leave a rating or a review. We're always keen to hear what you think. Thank you so much for listening and goodbye. Penguin Random House Audio presents Once Upon a River by Diane Setterfield, best-selling author of The Thirteenth Tale. On a dark midwinter's night in an ancient inn on the Thames, the door bursts open and in steps an injured stranger. In his arms is the drowned corpse of a child. Hours later, the dead girl returns to life. Is it a miracle? Is it magic? And who does the little girl belong to? Before Margot plunged the injured man's clothes into the bucket of fresh water, Jonathan went through his pockets. They gave up one purse, swollen with water, 
containing a sum of money that would cover all kinds of expenses and still stand them all a drink when he was feeling better. One handkerchief, sodden. One pipe, unbroken, and a tin of tobacco. They prized open the lid and found the contents to be dry. You'll be glad of that, at least, they noted. One ring, to which were linked a number of dainty tools and implements, over which they puzzled. Was he a clockmender? they wondered. A locksmith? A burglar? Until the next item was drawn out. One photograph. And then they remembered the dark stains on the man's fingers, and Rita's idea that he might be a photographer, and this seemed to lend weight to it. The tools must be something to do with a man's profession. An exquisitely crafted, multi-layered mystery brimming with folklore, suspense and romance, Once Upon a River is a richly atmospheric novel read by Juliet Stevenson. It's available to download now from all audiobook retailers.